Hello, this is Matt Dean with A-Plus College Ready. Today, we're going to talk about photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, light energy from the sun or other sources is converted to chemical energy and stored in the bonds of glucose. Plants, algae, some protists, like the euglena, for example, and some bacteria, the ones we call cyanobacteria, are capable of carrying out photosynthesis. The reactants for the process include CO2, which is taken in through the stomates or the stomata, usually on the bottoms of the leaves, water, taken in through the roots from the ground, and light, which is absorbed by the pigment proteins like chlorophyll and the carotenoids that are located in the leaves. The overall products of photosynthesis include glucose and oxygen gas. It's important to realize that even though we know that plants do photosynthesis, photosynthesizers also usually carry out aerobic cellular respiration. They need oxygen gas as a reactant for doing this, this process. So during photosynthesis, they make oxygen. They usually make more than they need for aerobic cellular respiration so they can release some to the environment. But it's very important to realize that photosynthesizers generally do both photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration. Here's the balanced equation for photosynthesis. Let's look at the top version first. So again, we see that the reactants are carbon dioxide, again, taken in from the air um, and usually taken in through the stomata or the stomates, water taken in from the ground through the roots, light absorbed by the pigment proteins, and the products of the process are glucose and oxygen gas. Now, normally we don't list this water here, the process makes some water, but notice we make six over here on this side on the right, but we used 12 over here. So normally we cancel these out and we leave this as 6H2O on the reactant side. Now the version of the equation we see down here on the bottom is essentially the empirical formula for uh, photosynthesis. An empirical formula, if you think back to chemistry, is essentially one in which um, the formula has been reduced. So notice what we did here is we essentially factored a six out of everything up top. So we were left with carbon dioxide, water, light and chlorophyll, oxygen gas, and this thing, which is a, one of the building blocks of glucose. If you put six of these together, you get six C6, H12O6. So know those equations for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis occurs in uh, two main stages or phases. Phase one is called the light dependent reactions. Um, they occur in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. And we'll look at those in a second. But these are located in the leaves. That's in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, um, there are no chloroplasts. So the light dependent reactions occur on the folds of the cell membrane. That's where we will find the pigment proteins in a bacteria, for example, like a cyanobacteria. During the light dependent reactions, light energy is absorbed and it's used to reduce um, these chemicals that are called electron acceptors or electron carriers. The main one in photosynthesis is NADP+. Once that gets reduced, it becomes NADPH. I want you to think of NADP+, sort of like a, um, a dead but rechargeable battery and NADH as more of a charged up battery. And the process that converts NADP plus to NADPH is reduction. And that's adding electrons and energy and also some hydrogens to it. And the, this, so this is a form NADPH of stored energy that will be used in other parts of photosynthesis to make the sugar. The light energy during photosynthesis is also used to power a, a proton gradient, to build up a proton gradient or hydrogen ion gradient, um, which will be used during chemiosmosis to make ATP. And it, we know that ATP is another form of stored energy, which will also be used later in photosynthesis to make the sugar. Oxygen gas is released during this first phase of photosynthesis as a byproduct of the light dependent reactions. Phase two is called the Calvin cycle. You'll also hear it sometimes called the Calvin Benson cycle or the light independent reactions. You used to hear it called the dark reactions. Let's don't use that terminology. 
because this can happen during the light and typically does. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast in eukaryotic cells like plants and in the cytoplasm of photosynthetic bacteria or prokaryotes. During the Calvin cycle, the energy from both the NADPH and the ATP um, is used to reduce and phosphorylate carbon dioxide gas and create this molecule, a three carbon molecule called G3P. Two of these G3Ps can be combined together and ultimately they'll make glucose. Glucose, its function in a plant or a photosynthesizer is it's an energy storage molecule. What makes it maybe better than NADPH and ATP is it's more stable. The other two, NADPH and ATP, are very reactive. They're hard to, to store. They're hard to transport. Glucose, on the other hand, is much more stable. Uh, it's easy to store. It's easier to transport. Since most of the photosynthesis happens in the leaves, the plants have to transport energy in the form of glucose or sucrose, some kind of sugar, to the roots or to the stems. Let's talk a little bit about the chloroplast. The chloroplasts are the locations for photosynthesis in plants and algae. They're like a container, a pigment container. We might call them plast a plastid, a form of plastid. Like mitochondria, the chloroplasts have their own single circular piece of DNA, single circular chromosome. They have their own ribosomes, which are different than typical eukaryotic ribosomes, and they have their own enzymes. They can re reproduce independently of the cell they're located in, in a process very similar to binary fission. Remember, the reason we think this occurs is that scientists think that chloroplast and mitochondria originated from um, independent bacteria that were taken into a larger bacteria and that over time they formed this symbiotic mutualistic relationship in which they became parts of each other. And we think that's how organelles and ultimately eukaryotic cells were formed. That idea, if you think back to unit one, is called the endosymbiotic hypothesis. Very important idea. The interior of a chloroplast is composed of stacks of sac-like structures that we call thylakoids. Um, the pigment molecules are embedded within the membranes of those thylakoids. Stacks, a stack of thylakoids is called a granum. And the stack-like arrangement increases the surface area inside the chloroplast so that more photosynthesis can happen. The area around the thylakoids is fluid-filled. It's called the stroma. It's much like the cytoplasm of a cell. The stroma is the location of the Calvin cycle. So here's a picture of a chloroplast and these tiny little sacs Tiny little sacs are called our thylakoids. A stack of sacs, again, is a granum, and the fluid-filled space within that chloroplast is the stroma. Note that this chloroplast has its own piece of DNA and it has its own ribosomes. Very, and these ribosomes are very similar to bacterial ribosomes. Now let's talk a little bit about light energy. Sunlight is a form of high-quality or usable electromagnetic energy um, that organisms used to do work. Sunlight travels in waves with different wavelengths and frequencies. Waves with different wavelengths and frequencies have different uh, amounts of energy and they also appear different colors to us. But they have different amounts of energy per photon. I want you to think of a photon as the smallest piece of light. It's a smallest discrete amount or a quantum of electromagnetic radiation. It's the basic unit of light, but it's the smallest possible package of light. Photons are always moving, and at least in a vacuum, they travel at a constant speed, the speed of light, of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The equation that we see on this page relates the uh, speed of light, the wavelength, and the frequency of light. So lots of times we'll see it written like this. C is the speed of light, since it's a constant. That's why it's C. Lambda is this funny little symbol. It stands for the wavelength. That's going to be measured in meters or some, some type of um, length measurement. And frequency. How many waves occur per second? 
that's typically going to be measured in hertz. So since the speed of light always has to stay the same, as the wavelength of, of light increases, the frequency must decrease. As the frequency increases, the wavelength must decrease. So we might say that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. And here we see that on our PowerPoint that here's our equation. Wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. Waves with a longer wavelength have a lower frequency. Waves with a shorter wavelength have a higher frequency. Another really important point, the frequency of light is directly related to the amount of energy contained per photon. What that means is that waves with a higher frequency have more energy per photon. Waves with a lower frequency have less energy per photon. Here's what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. It shows us all the different types of electromagnetic radiation or, or light. Notice that only a very small part of that spectrum is actually visible to us. We call this the visible spectrum. And, and notice we see the whole Roy G. Biv setup where we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now I also want you to notice that the blues and the violets have the shortest wavelength. And since they have the shortest wavelength, they have the highest frequency. And because they have the highest frequency, they have the most amount of energy per photon. The reds have the longest wavelength, therefore the lowest frequency, and therefore the lowest amount of energy per photon. Also, let's go up to the top here. Notice that these uh, types of light that I circled, including UV, X-rays, and these are gamma rays, they have very, very, very high frequencies. That means they have very, very short wavelengths, but they have lots of energy per photon. That's why all three of these are dangerous, and they can cause burns, they can cause cancer, whereas the, the, the types of light over here have very, very long wavelengths, very, very low frequencies, and therefore not very much energy per photon. We're not worried about these causing you a lot of damage because they don't have enough energy to do that. This electromagnetic spectrum, again, illustrates that relationship between frequency and wavelength for each type of electromagnetic radiation. And like we said before, it indicates that the blues and purples have the shortest wavelength, the highest frequency, and the most energy per photon, while the reds and oranges have the longest wavelength, the lowest frequency, and the least amount of energy per photon. Let's talk a little bit about absorption and reflection. Different types of pigment proteins are different colors, mainly because they absorb and reflect different wavelengths or colors of light. The light energy that's absorbed is the energy that's used to make glucose. The reflected light isn't used at all by the plant. Plants have three main groups of pigments. There's chlorophyll A, um, this, this, this is the main one. It's a protein made of a porphyrin ring, which we'll look at in a minute, the protein type ring. It has a central atom of magnesium, the metal in the middle. Its structure is a lot like hemoglobin in us. Remember the hemoglobin is the protein in the blood that helps you transport oxygen. Hemoglobin is built around iron whereas chlorophyll is built around magnesium. Chlorophyll A is best at absorbing blue and red wavelengths of light. It reflects greens and yellows, and that's why it looks green. Chlorophyll B is a little bit more yellowish, uh, but it's still green. It's an accessory pigment. This means that it absorbs some wavelengths of light that chlorophyll A can't. It passes those on to certain molecules of chlorophyll A. And then we have the carotenoids. These are the yellowish, orange, and red pigments, uh, which, like chlorophyll B, are accessory pigments and help the, the plant or the photosynthesizer to capture light energy that chlorophyll A can't. Here we see chlorophyll A. In the center, we have a magnesium atom. Notice that's attached to some nitrogens. And these ring-like structures are mostly made of carbons and hydrogens. So these are 
it's important to remember that chlorophyll is a protein. So now we need to talk a little bit about photosystems. Photosystems are arrangements of chlorophyll A molecules and other pigments like chlorophyll B and carotenoids. I want you to think of the photosystems like arrays of solar panels. The job of these pigments in these photosystems is to capture energy and they funnel the energy to a, a pair of molecule, a pair of chlorophyll A molecules uh, in the middle called the reaction center. Sometimes you'll hear these molecules called the special pair. Once enough energy, uh, once energy releases this special pair, it's not passed on to other pigments. Instead, it just keeps gaining energy and gaining energy. Eventually, the electrons gain so much energy that they're expelled. They're um, released. And the special pair is said to be oxidized. Those electrons are passed on to a molecule called the primary electron acceptor. And with that transfer, those electrons begin their journey through what we call the ETC, or the electron transport chain of photosynthesis. We'll talk about two different types of photosystems in the light-dependent reactions, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Even though photosystem 2 usually comes first in the path of electron flow, it's named photosystem 2 because it was discovered before, uh, I'm sorry, discovered after photosystem 1. The chlorophyll A special pairs of the two photosystems are slightly different. They absorb slightly different wavelengths of light. The PS2 special pair absorbs best at 680, uh, while the PS1 special pair absorbs best around 700 nanometers. Because of this, the special pairs are called six, P680 and P700, respectively. Note that both of these wavelengths are in the orangey-red part of the color range. Most chlorophyll molecules actually absorb blue wavelengths a little bit better than orange and reds. The P680 and the P700 numbers refer to the maximum absorption for the entire photosystem. That takes into account all the chlorophylls and all the carotenoids and so forth. So we also need to discuss very briefly what's called the absorption spectrum. So this is the set of wavelengths absorbed by a pigment. We're going to see on the diagram on the next slide an absorption spectrum that highlights chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and beta carotene, one of the car carotenoid proteins. Remember that the wavelengths that aren't absorbed are reflected, and that's what we actually see when we look at a pigment. So here's the absorption spectrum. Notice that chlorophyll A in the very dark green absorbs best in the bluish range, and then it also absorbs over in the, the orangey red part of the color spectrum. Whereas chlorophyll B absorbs best in a little bit more toward the lighter blues. Uh, again, in the greenish area, it reflects. It absorbs some in the orangey red part of the spectrum. Whereas the carotenoids shown on this slide in yellow, they absorb um, some blues. They absorb a little bit in the greenish part of the color spectrum but they reflect the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, and that's why they look yellow, orange, or red. Next, we're going to talk about the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. This is the part of photosynthesis that occurs first. Has to happen in the light. This process occurs on the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast, or if we're talking about bacteria, it occurs on the folds of the cell membrane. During this process, the light energy from the sun is absorbed. It's used to produce the energy storage molecules ATP and NADPH. Oxygen gas is made and it's released as a byproduct. The light-dependent reactions actually occur in two different ways in most photosynthesizers. And these have some confusing names. They're called non-cyclic photophosphorylation and cyclic photophosphorylation. Typically, these two processes occur simultaneously across the thousands of photosystems that are located on each thylakoid membrane. All right, let's discuss non-cyclic photophosphorylation first. Non-cyclic photophosphorylation is sometimes called non-cyclic non electron flow. During this process, photosystems first absorb light. This absorbed light is then funneled to the reaction center molecules of each photosystem, 
And eventually so much energy is absorbed that it causes these reaction centers or special pairs to be oxidized. That means they lose electrons. This pair of electrons is released from the reaction center of each photosystem and it starts to travel through the cytochrome complex or ETC, electron transport chain. The electrons are eventually used to reduce photosystem one's reaction center. These are the electrons from photosystem two. As the electrons move across the ETC uh, from photosystem two to photosystem one, their energy is used to power the active transport of hydrogen ions or protons from the stroma um, into the thylakoid. This starts to build up a um, hydrogen ion or proton gradient, much like the one that occurs during the ETC stage of cell respiration. This is a process of storing potential energy within the thylakoid. And this energy will eventually be used during chemiosmosis to manufacture ATP. The electrons that leave photosystem one also travel through an ETC. These electrons, though, ultimately are used to reduce the electron carrier or electron uh, acceptor NADP plus to make NADPH. NADP plus is much like the NADA or NAD plus that works during aerobic cell respiration. As I said earlier in this video, think of NADP plus as a dead but rechargeable battery and NADPH as the charged version of the battery. The electrons and the energy from photosystem one charge this molecular battery and the energy stored in NADPH is used during the Calvin cycle to help to make glucose. We can see the equation for how this works at the bottom of the slide here. Here we have NADP plus. Notice that during reduction, it receives electrons and hydrogen ions to become NADPH. So this is reduction going from left to right. So let's talk a little bit more about non-cyclic photophosphorylation. The hydrogen ions within the thylakoid eventually rush out via a channel within, a, within an enzyme called ATP synthase. There's such a big gradient that these hydrogen ions rush out with a lot of kinetic energy. This enzyme is able to use that kinetic energy to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. This process of using energy from a proton gradient uh, to make ATP is called chemiosmosis. And the energy from, then, from this ATP is used during the Calvin cycle to help make glucose. One other product formed during non-cyclic photophosphorylation is oxygen gas. After photosystem two is oxidized, um, it becomes positive. The photosystem then grabs onto water molecules and essentially rips those apart. It's almost like mugging water molecules. And what, what the photosystem two needs is, is electrons to replace the ones it lost. Sometimes I make an analogy here to like a, somebody that's addicted to drugs that if they don't have them, they, um, um, they go into, um, just this obsession with finding drugs. Think of photosystem two as if it, it needs these electrons and it commits a crime here. It rips apart water molecules and essentially it steals those electrons from waters. What this leaves behind is hydrogen ions, which will be helpful for building up that gradient, but also oxygen atoms. Now we know that from chemistry that oxygen doesn't usually um, exist as a single atom. So when two water molecules are split, the oxygens come together to form oxygen gas. This process of splitting water is called photolysis because it's using light energy to split the water. And as I said a minute ago, the remains of the split water molecules are the hydrogen ions, which help to build up that H plus gradient in the thylakoid and oxygen gas. Essentially all of oxygen or all of Earth's oxygen gas originated in water molecules those water molecules were split and that oxygen, at least some of it, was released into the air. Here's sort of a diagram of how non-cyclic photophosphorylation works. Now remember these photosystems and also these cytochromes are embedded in the thylakoid membranes inside the chloroplast. So here we see photosystem two is absorbing energy. 
eventually it it, it absorbs so much energy that the uh, reaction center is oxidized. It loses some electrons. We think of it as a pair. Those then move through the ETC. As they move through, the energy of those electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid. Eventually, the two electrons end up reducing uh, the reaction center in PS1. But in the meantime, PS1 also lost some electrons as it absorbed energy. Those electrons go through a different ETC. Ultimately, uh, they're used to reduce NADP plus to make NADPH. This happens out in the stroma. Remember also that photosystem 2's reaction center needs some electrons. It gets those back by doing photolysis. It splits water molecules, essentially steals the electrons from those water molecules, and that creates additional H pluses. It also is where our O2 comes from. So that's non-cyclic photophosphorylation. It makes three main products, NADPH uh, and ATP, both energy storage molecules, and O2. Remember, there's also another form of the light-dependent reactions, and that's called cyclic photophosphorylation. It's also called cyclic electron flow. This process occurs at the same time as non-cyclic photophosphorylation, but it only involves photosystem 1. During this process, photosystem 1's pigment proteins absorb light, funnel it to the reaction center molecules in photosystem 1, and it causes the reaction center to be oxidized. The ejected pair of electrons moves through a different ETC network than the one used during the non-cyclic version of this process. As these electrons move through the ETC, their energy is again used to power the active transport of hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid. This builds up a hydrogen ion gradient and helps to store energy. The hydrogen ions eventually move through the channel within the ATP synthase and exit um, the thylakoid. And this kinetic energy is used to uh, phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. Again, that's called chemiosmosis. But what's different in this process is that the, the electrons that leave photosystem one move in an ETC that takes them in a circle. So eventually they come back to photosystem one. So this means that no water needs to be split, no oxygen gas is created, and also, since the electrons return to photosystem one where they came from, no NADPH is created in this process either. The only product of cyclic photophosphorylation is ATP. Again, no oxygen gas or NADPH are produced. The name of this process is really descriptive of, of what happens. The cyclic portion of the name refers to the fact that the ejected electrons essentially move in a circle. They leave photosystem one, they go through an ETC, uh, an arrangement of cytochrome proteins, and ultimately end up coming back to the reaction center that they left. The phosphorylation portion of the name refers to the fact that the energy from the movement of the hydrogen ions is used to add a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. Here we can see that happening. So. The reaction center in photosystem one absorbs light energy. It loses a pair of electrons. Those move through an ETC or cytochrome complex, eventually come back to the reaction center they left. But in the meantime, the energy of those electrons is used to pump H pluses or protons, build up a hydrogen ion gradient, which will ultimately provide the energy for chemiosmosis, the creation of ATP. So this compares the two processes of cyclic photophosphorylation and non-cyclic. Non-cyclic involves both photosystems. Cyclic only involves photosystem one. Uh, during non-cyclic photophosphorylation, photolysis of water happens. Remember, water is the source of the electrons. Cyclic photophosphorylation doesn't require water at all. During non-cyclic photophosphorylation, oxygen gas is evolved or released. During the cyclic version, it's not. During the non-cyclic version, NADPH is created. It's not during the cyclic version. Non-cyclic photophosphorylation, its products are used um, 
part, as part of the light dependent re, independent reactions. Cyclic photophosphorylation is used mainly to produce additional ATP that the cell needs for, for energy. The, the other part of the, the photosynthetic, photosynthetic process is the Calvin cycle or light independent stage of photosynthesis. Um, during this stage, the energy from NADPH and ATP from the light dependent reactions are used to help make sugar. And remember, the reason a plant or a photosynthesizer needs to make sugar is that the NADPH and ATP are very chemically reactive and they can't be stored or transported very efficiently. And since most of the photosynthesis occurs in the leaves, the plant has to have a molecule that it can store and transport to places like the stem and the roots. That's the role of glucose. So the Calvin cycle's job is essentially to take the unstable energy storage molecules, NADPH and ATP, and transfer that energy into a more stable, more storable, more transportable molecule, which ultimately ends up being glucose. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of eukaryotic cells and in the cytoplasm of photosynthetic bacteria or prokaryotes. The phases of the Calvin cycle start off with phase one. It's called carbon fixation. During this phase, a molecule of carbon dioxide gas is attached to a five carbon chain that's already in the, in the plant called ribulose bisphosphate. Sometimes we'll see that called RUBP. And that connection, which is what fixation means, is done by an enzyme called Rubisco, or R it's also known as RUBP carboxylase. Turns out Rubisco is the most common protein on earth, largely because it's not very efficient at what it does. It works, but not in not a very efficient way. The attachment of the carbon dioxide molecule to the five carbon RUBP molecule forms an unstable six carbon molecule. This quickly breaks down into, three, into two three carbon chains that are called phosphoglycerate, or I'll usually refer to these as PGA molecules. I want you to think of a PGA molecule as essentially half of a glucose, but without very much stored energy. Phase two of the Calvin cycle is called a reduction. During this phase, the, the PGA molecules formed during part one are energized. They're energized using the energy from the energy storage molecules that were made during the light dependent part of photosynthesis. First, the phosphate groups and energy from ATP molecules are used, are transferred to PGA. The PG, we might say the PGA molecules are phosphorylated. Next, the PGA molecules are reduced, uh, and this is using the electrons and the energy from the NADPH molecules. This process of um, reduction forms a three carbon compound known as glyceraldehyde three phosphate. We'll usually call that G3P. So we can think of G3P as half of a glucose with the stored energy. Two G3P molecules can be combined to make glucose. G3P is also sometimes used to synthesize other sugars and organic molecules that a plant needs, things like starch and cellulose, etc. We're going to look at a Calvin cycle diagram on the next uh, page, and we'll see that it, it occurs, it shows what happens for every three carbon dioxide molecules that are fixed. Let's talk, before we do that though, let's talk about phase three. Phase three is called regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor or ribulose bisphosphate. During this phase, five of the six G3P molecules that are made during one cycle are not taken out by the plant to, to use to make glucose. Those five G3Ps instead are used to remake the ribulose bisphosphate. So again, this sounds like a very inefficient process and it is. Each turn of the Calvin cycle form six G3P molecules. Only one of those is actually used in the process of making glucose. Five of, of them are used to regenerate the CO2 acceptor and keep the process going. So here's the Calvin cycle diagram. You don't need to memorize this whole process. What you need to realize is that first of all, the plant takes in CO2. It comes in through the stomates. 
Part one is carbon fixation. This is when the enzyme Rubisco grabs on to three carbon dioxide molecules and attaches those to three five carbon molecules called ribulose bisphosphates or RUBPs. That forms um, an unstable intermediate, three unstable six carbon molecules, which break very quickly into six three carbon molecules that we referred to earlier as PGA molecules. And I told you to think of those as half of a glucose without very much stored energy. So part two of the Calvin cycle is reduction. And this is where the energy from ATP and NADPH, both created during the light dependent reactions, is essentially added to the PGA molecules. Once that's done, once the PGA molecules are first phosphorylated and then reduced, we end up with six molecules of what's called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P. I told you earlier to think of these G3Ps as half of a glucose with energy, with stored energy. Note that one of those six G3Ps are taken out and used to make glucose or organic molecules. But the other five are used to remake ribulose bisphosphate so that the cycle can continue going. So that's the Calvin cycle. Now, let's also talk about a problem for some plants, or actually for all plants. It's called photorespiration. I told you a minute ago that the carbon-fixing enzyme Rubisco is not very efficient. It has some evolutionary flaws. One of those is that it's capable of attaching both CO2 and oxygen gas to ribulose bisphosphate. The attachment of CO2 is important and ultimately leads to the creation of G3P and glucose. But when oxygen is attached, no glucose is made, and the products of this process of fixing oxygen actually requires the cell to use energy to rid itself of the products of oxygen fixation. So the process of fixing oxygen instead of carbon dioxide and the decrease in photosynthetic efficiency is called photorespiration. When the environment's not too hot and there's plenty of water available in the soil, photorespiration isn't a huge problem. But when the environment is hot and dry, Plants are, fo are forced oftentimes to close their stomata to keep in water. When the stomates are closed, the concentration of oxygen in the leaf rapidly increases because photosynthesis is releasing oxygen. But the, co the concentration of carbon dioxide rapidly decreases because the plant is using the CO2 to make sugar. When these conditions occur, there's more oxygen available than CO2 and oxygen is, starts to be fixed more regularly than CO2. This creates a dramatic decrease in photosynthetic efficiency. And if, it, if this, these conditions persist, persist for long periods of time and the stomates have to stay closed, the plant will either die or it may enter some kind of dormant state. So photosynthetic, photorespiration rather, is an issue. And it's a, a bad issue when the environment is very hot and very dry. So here we see the stomata. So remember, the stomates are, are almost like the nostrils of a plant. They're the breathing holes. And typically, they're going to bring CO2 in and send out oxygen. On either side of a stomate are cells called guard cells. And when they're swollen up and turgid, that makes the hole, the stomate, be open. But when those guard cells shrink down, become flaccid, that closes up the stomate. So when it's very hot and very dry, the guard cells will go into this condition and they'll close up the holes and that helps the plant to retain water. But it also ends up leading to photorespiration issues. So most plants are called C3 plants. They perform the Calvin cycle just as we scribe, described so far. They're the most efficient of all plants as long as the environment isn't too hot or too dry. But they do have a serious issue with photorespiration in hot and dry places. If they close their stomates to conserve water, they carry out a large amount of photorespiration and it happens very fast. There's another group of, of plants called C4 plants, and these are plants like corn and cotton. They have some adaptations that will let them avoid photorespiration. We'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, let's go ahead and talk about it now. In the mesophyll or the middle of the leaf, C4 plants have an additional carbon-fixing enzyme called PEP carboxylase. 
This enzyme is not attracted to oxygen at all. It only grabs onto CO2 and fixes it. Once PEP fixes the carbon dioxide, this fixed carbon is transported into a small enclosed chamber called the bundle sheath. This is an area around the veins, the xylem and phloem of the leaf. Once inside the bundle sheath, the CO2 is re-released. Rubisco is present inside this bundle sheath. Rubisco be then begins to fix the carbon and the Calvin cycle happens in C4 plants, just as it did in C3. But because the Rubisco is kept in this small enclosed area and CO2 is being constantly released in that small enclosed area, the CO2 concentration remains high. And as long as the CO2 concentration is high, higher than the oxygen concentration, Rubisco works efficiently without much photorespiration. So sometimes we say in C4 plants, the Calvin cycle and the initial carbon fixation step are spatially separated. They happen in different places. The initial carbon fixation in a C4 plant happens with PEP carboxylase in the middle of the leaf, the mesophyll. Whereas the Calvin cycle happens with Rubisco in the smaller, more enclosed bundle sheath area. What this allows a plant to, or a C4 plant to do is it allows these plants to close their stomates for extended amounts of time, conserve water, and do that without carrying out a large amount of photorespiration. So it's a huge advantage in hot, dry places. Now there's another type of plant called cam plants. These are plants like the cactus. They are the most highly adapted to life in hot, dry places. Like the C4 plants, they have PEP carboxylase. But an additional adaptation of cam plants is that they only open their stomata at night when it's cool in the desert. They keep them closed all day when it's hot. So during the night, PEP carboxylase fixes carbon and it stores it as a compound called malate. Once the sun comes up, the stomata close. Again, that helps the plants to conserve the water. But during that day, that malate breaks down and releases a constant supply of CO2 within the leaf. Since there's constant supply of CO2, Rubisco will now fix the carbon and carry out the Calvin cycle. And not a lot of photorespiration happens because there's a high concentration of CO2 within the leaf all the time. In cam plants, we say that carbon fixation and the Calvin cycle are temporally separated because they happen at different times, different parts of the day. Cam plants are by far the best plant group in terms of dealing with very hot and dry conditions. So here we sort of see a comparison between the three types of plants. C3 plants only have RUBP carboxylase or Rubisco as their carbon fixing enzyme. And as we said, that's okay as long as it doesn't get hot and dry. But if it does get hot and dry, they start doing a lot of photorespiration and that's an issue. C4 plants have PEP carboxylase in the mesophyll. They fix the carbon, eventually form malate, uh, transform or transfer that malate into the bundle sheath. The malate breaks down and releases a constant supply of CO2 so that Rubisco can fix it and carry out the Calvin cycle. Again, we said that in C4 plants, there's spatial separation of the initial carbon fixation and of the Calvin cycle. Cam plants, on the other hand, use PEP carboxylase to make malate. Um, that they do that at night when the stomata are open, when it's cool in the desert. The, the cactus, for example, doesn't have to lose, doesn't have to worry about losing a lot of water. During the day, that malate breaks down, releases a constant supply of CO2, so that Rubisco can fix it and carry out the Calvin cycle. So again, C4 and cam plants have adaptations that let them deal with hot, dry conditions and let them thrive in those conditions without doing a whole lot of photorespiration. That's our